the Churches of Christ of the North Texas area present The Truth in Love. How precious is the good divine by inspiration given. Bright as the lamp is precept shine to guide my soul to heaven. Holy by divine, precious treasure mine. Lamp to my feet and the light to my way to guide me safely home. This lamp through all the tedious night of life shall guide my way till I behold the clearer light of an eternal day. Holy but divine, precious treasure thou art mine, lamp to my feet and the light to my way to guide me safely home. Good morning and welcome to The Truth and Love. I'm Leslie Parks, your host for today's program. I'm so glad that you're letting us come into your home once again and with these fine lessons from God's Word. We have another wonderful program planned for today and I'll be telling you more about it in just a moment. I want you to get a pencil and piece of paper ready because at the end of the program I'll be telling you about an upcoming series and how you can receive a free study booklet to go along with that series. On today's telecast, David Roper will be our speaker. You may know him as a regular host for The Truth and Love. He'll be speaking on the topic of God's help for today's home. I'm sure you won't want to miss this vital lesson. He'll be with you after this song. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. A few weeks ago, one of the congregations here in this area had a series of lectures entitled, These are the Times that Try Men's Souls, a quotation from Thomas Paine. And certainly this phrase characterizes our age also. And I spoke on the topic, These are the Times that Try Today's Homes. Are these not troublesome times? Last week I tried to outline some of the symptoms of this problem. The effort to replace the traditional home and family, specifically the home and family outlined in the Bible. Again, the breakdown of the home is seen in the increase of divorce in the single parent homes. And then further, the situation where even when people stay together, they're not happy and sometimes violence erupts and where there's silence and there's general unhappiness in that home. We suggested that the consequences of this are so terrible. There's great unhappiness in so many areas. We also find a general undermining of the very society and civilization we love here in America because as the home crumbles, society also must be affected. And then finally we noted most importantly that we today are disobeying God. We're not having the homes that God wants us to have. 
We suggested that we today have to find an answer. It's necessary. We can't let things go on simply as they are. And that the only real answer is to be found in this book, not with my ideas and your ideas, with human opinions, but rather in the pages of God's holy book. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I want to give you four or three suggestions rather here this morning. And hopefully these three suggestions can start you on a study of this book to discover God's will for your life in general and for your home in particular. The first suggestion I want to give is if the home is to be helped, we have to start with God's idea of marriage because after all, marriage is the basis of the home. And listen to me very carefully now. In each marriage, we need a man and a woman who are committed to God and to each other. Now please notice that I began by saying we need a man and woman committed to God. That's the beginning place. I think all of us are acquainted with passages that speak of husbands needing to love their wives and wives needing to love their husbands. We'll read one of those a little later. But here's an interesting passage as Jesus makes a statement in Luke the 14th chapter, verse 26. When you first read it, it's even startling. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. They say, let me read that again. Jesus, did you say I'm supposed to hate my wife and hate my children? That's what Jesus said. Well, those who are acquainted with the Bible know that he's, he's contrasting something here. The word hate is used in the sense of love less. Your love for God is to be so great that anything else in comparison is only going to be compared to hate. But I think he's establishing a very, very important point. If we're to have homes as God wants them to be, we must first of all have a priority higher than ourselves, a commitment to something higher than ourselves. You know, what's the basic problem in family relationships and married relationships and all relationships in life? The basic problem is selfishness. I want my way. I want to do it the way I want to do it. I don't care what happens to other people as long as I'm happy. One analyst said that a lot of people today when they say, I love you, really mean I love me and I want you. Well, Jesus says, now to get out of that selfishness, you first of all commit yourself to God. You have a higher commitment than self. But then secondly, two people who are committed to God and to each other. Committed, committed for life. Jesus stressed that that commitment for life is not an optional thing. I'm turning now to Matthew, the 19th chapter. In this chapter, we have the story of the Pharisees as they came to Jesus, testing him, trying him, trying to trap him. They knew that there were two schools of thought about marriage and divorce in his day, and they wanted him to commit himself self to one side or another. It's going to make somebody unhappy, they thought. And so they asked him this question in verse 3. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now notice verse 4 as Jesus escapes their trap. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain, or they two, shall be one flesh. Wherefore there are no more twain or two, but one flesh. Listen now, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You see, he escaped their trap. He didn't go back to the previous generation or to some other school of thought. He went all the way back to the beginning, to God's original plan for the home. They said, now this is the way God established it. That's the way God wants it to be. Well, this, of course, put them on the defensive. So now in verse 7, they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered or allowed you, not commanded you, suffered or allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. This has never been God's plan for the home. Jesus says, now listen carefully to verse 9. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Jesus said, Here you have two people. They're married in the sight of man. They're also married in the sight of God. And what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. 
And these individuals can go through all the divorce courts in the world unless they put away their, might, uh, their mate because that mate was guilty of sexual unfaithfulness. They're still married in God's sight and therefore they are guilty of adultery. Jesus said marriage is for life. That commitment must be for life. And I care not how many laws may be passed by the courts of our land and how many people look for loopholes. Jesus still says the same thing. Matthew 19 still reads the same way. Marriage is for life. That's the kind of commitment that has to be made for marriage to be what it should be and thus for the home to be what it should be. Someone says, oh, look, you're, you're talking impossibility. You know, how do I know what's going to happen in my life? How, how do I know how I'm going to change and that person's going to change? How can I possibly make a commitment for life? Well, it's interesting in the same opening just across the page, we have Jesus discussing another hard subject. The disciples are somewhat disturbed about it. And Jesus says this, verse 26, same chapter, Matthew 19. With men this is impossible, but listen again, with God all things are possible. Paul said, what, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. If you have that commitment to God, if you have that relationship with God, you see, you can do it. And I dare say that right out there in the television audience, there are people who have been married 30, 40, 50 years, had the same problems everybody else has had, but they've, they've done it. They're living together, and they've celebrated those anniversaries year after year. They've had problems, sure, but they've had that commitment in their heart and life to each other. They're still living and loving one another. Now, that word love brings up the way that we make our own special contribution to that commitment. The word I want to especially talk about is the Greek word agape. That's the most common word for love in the New Testament, found 115 times in the New Testament. Now, that word agape does, doesn't refer to just a warm feeling that you have or physical attraction. It has to do with a commitment that's made, an act of the will, as I say, this is what I am going to do. I am going to love this person the rest of my life. Now that commitment is at least threefold. Maybe some other aspects could be mentioned in the area of marriage, but at least threefold. Commitment number one is a commitment to stay together. We're going to tough it out. We're going to work out problems as they come. But it's more than that. It's also a commitment to be faithful. Now to me, it's very, very sad that this even has to be mentioned. That as I am making a commitment to my mate, I'm making a commitment to be faithful sexually to my mate for the rest of my life. But unfortunately, in the society in which we live, in which such a thing is little thought of, we have to stop and stress that point. I'm making a commitment to be faithful. For instance, notice Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. In other words, the marriage bed is undefiled. That's part of God's plan. God intended it. It's a beautiful thing in the context of marriage. But notice it. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And judge is used here in the sense of condemn. Yes, sex and marriage is beautiful outside of marriage. It's unauthorized by God. And those who do such things have their place in the fire that burns forever and ever. Revelation chapters 20 and 21. But again, it's not just those negative aspects of a commitment to stay together for life and a commitment to be faithful to your mate. It also is a commitment to express that love. A lot of times as we talk about agape love, it's so beautiful, so great. That's the way God is expressed. First John, the fourth, fourth chapter, verse 8 and 16, God is love. We talk about that love and people get kind of overwhelmed. They say, how could I possibly love that way? Well, Paul answers that question in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. It's the great love chapter. You recognize that. In verses 4 through 7, Paul breaks love down. And he begins to say, love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, and so on. And someone says, well, you know, how can I love? Paul says, okay, okay. It's, if you just think about love and, and, and that big word and, and the big concept, it sounds impossible. But... He then asked this question, in effect, can you learn to be kind? Can you learn to be unselfish? Can you learn to be a little more patient? You see, it's these, quote, little things that together make up this wondrous thing that's called love, agape love. That's the kind of commitment that God says that we need to have. And so the first suggestion I make is if, if we're going to help the home today, we start with the basic 
beginning foundation of the home, which is marriage. And understand God's concept of marriage, a man and a woman committed to God and to each other. In this respect, I've got to say just a word to the young people out there in the audience this morning. If you're going to have in your marriage two people committed to God and to each other, you need to marry a Christian. Now, I don't just mean somebody that's been under the water. I don't just mean somebody you met at a, at a church function, at a church camp, at a church school. I mean a real, genuine Christian who's a member of the Lord's church and who's living the life that God wants him to live. Someone says, how can I spot that person? I don't know all the Bible. I might miss something. Let me give you just a simple way to do that. You turn to Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22 and 23. Write that down. Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22 and 23. You have there the fruits of the Spirit listed. And you find someone who's a member of the Lord's church, who's living that way, who has the fruits of the Spirit in his life. You found somebody committed to the Lord, and you be committed to the Lord, and you get married, and they have the home God wants you to have. A suggestion number two. If we're going to be able today to have the home and to help, help the home, we must also return to God's concept of the home. We must learn from the Bible what the home is all about and what our God-given roles are in that home. Now again, we go back to the first few chapters of Genesis, and God tells us why he established marriage in the home. He established so he wouldn't be lonely, so he'd have companionship. God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a help meter suitable for him. He established it so that we could be complete, so that we could be supplemented. That word meet there means that which helps, that which supplies, that which is lacking. Again, he did it for procreation. He said to that first couple, multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Or well, someone says, all right, there, you've shown that we can't really follow the, those rules laid down there in that book because don't you know that we have a population explosion today? Well, I guess we do. It may be not be as great as some people say, but I guess we do. But listen to me carefully. We don't have a Christian population explosion. We don't have too many Christians on this earth, and we need more Christian homes with Christian parents raising Christian children in the nurture and admonition of God. That's one of the reasons for that home. Again, we go to the rest of the New Testament. It continues to tell us why the home was established. 1 Corinthians 7 is to avoid fornication. We go to Paul's writing to Timothy, and we said, I, I wish that the young widows would marry and bear children, guide the house. He says, in effect, this gives a basic purpose and meaning to your life. You're not just making a living. You're not just uh, having things. But rather, there's a real purpose in all that you do. It's important to come to realize what God had in mind as he established the home. I like the way that Philip Morrison expressed it in a public publication called Upreach a few months ago. Listen to it. He says, if the family is not just social nicety or legal necessity, what is it? It's that God-ordained union of male and female designed biologically and emotionally to have need of one another. It's that tender awareness that husband and wife are the bone and flesh of one another, so inseparable that any fracturing is as painful as the severing of a limb from one's own body. It's that participation in bringing new life into the world, not just another human being to be counted as a population statistic, but a living soul, a likeness of God's own image. It's that willing, even eager sacrificing of one's own selfish interests for the good of others, which mean more than life. It's that beautiful expression of love, a love that cannot be defined with words or pictures, but only with experience and emotion that defies all logic. It's that pledging of a life and a lifetime to a unity of heart and soul that can be interrupted only by death. Yes, we need to read the Bible and come to understand why, why God established the home to bless mankind, what the purposes are. And yes, we need to come to see the roles God has for us within it. We have today a great identity crisis. We mentioned that last week. People not really sure what role they're supposed to play in life, what role they're supposed to play in marriage and in the home. God has told us those roles. Now, some people think it's a, it's a matter of inferiority. God said the man should be the head, the woman should uh, be submissive, and so on. It's not a matter of inferiority. It's a matter of identity. As a person knows how I fit into a beautiful, beautiful plan that can bring happiness to so many people. 
We can't read all the passages that would uh, speak to us concerning this particular area. I have just arbitrarily selected Ephesians 5. Some selected verses from chapter 5 and then going into the first part of chapter 6. This will give us some idea of the kind of clear-cut statements made in the Bible concerning the role of husband and wife and the children in the home and so on. I'm beginning my reading in verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with him, thou mayest live long on the earth. And your fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? We have a daddy that is accepting the leadership of the home. He's not a dictator, but he's leading that home in the right ways, including the spiritual way it ought to go. We have a mother that accepts the greatest challenge on the face of the earth, making a loving home for her family. And yes, we have children who love the parents, and parents are trying to set that right example, trying to teach them the right way. Suggestion number two. If the home is to be helped, we have to return to God's concept of the home, learn from the Bible what the home is all about, what our God-given roles are. Now, the third suggestion I have is very closely akin to this, but I want to mention it separately. If the home is to be helped, we have to return it to the position of importance that God gave it. Did you happen to see the interview of Barry Goldwater during the convention in Dallas back in August? Barry Goldwater was being interviewed, and he was asked this question, what's the high point of your life? Are you thinking about the, his years as a senator, his being a presidential candidate, all the honors he's received? But tears came to his eyes, and he said, the high point of my life is coming up in September. At that time, my wife and I will have been married 50 years. Now, we need some priorities in our life. We need to understand what's important, what's not so important. Don't we get so busy in life? You see, we've got to make a living, we've got to succeed, we have to build a bigger house, we have to have a nicer car. These things are not that important. Listen to me this morning. These things are not that important. No, they're not. If at the end of life you accomplish nothing else, but you can look back and say, I had a happy home, I had a happy marriage, you're going to say that was a good life. It was a rich life. If on the other hand, you succeeded immensely beyond your expectations as far as this world is concerned, and yet your marriage was a failure, your home was a failure, you're going to feel to that extent, look, I didn't make it in life. Priorities. We need to understand God thinks the home is important. Surely we, what we've seen shows that. All the teaching in God's Word concerning the home, all the instructions found in the book of Proverbs, in the book of Titus, and the book of Deuteronomy concerning the home, concerning raising our children. We see Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as He comes from heaven itself, as He comes to this earth. Where did God place Him? He placed Him in a humble home, didn't He? In the care of loving parents who helped Him grow up to be a dutiful son. You see, the home is so important. Yes, we today need to understand that homes don't just happen. We have to work on that home. We need some preventive work. We need to learn to communicate. We need to learn to express our love. We need to learn to be unselfish. And listen to me now. We need to learn that if a problem comes into our home, that we're not too proud to admit it and to seek some help. You know, pride can destroy. Did you know that? The Old Testament said that, that pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. We've abbreviated that to say pride goeth before a fall. And it can go before the destruction of your home, too. If you're too proud to say, I've got problems, we have problems, and we need some help. 
I want to tell you that the Church of Christ in your area want to help you. Did you know that? They want to help you. They're ready to help you. You do what you can. You read your Bible. You study your Bible. You be what you can be. And then seek help if you need to do it. Those of us who do some counseling understand that the hardest thing to get across to any person that sits across the desk or wherever from us is that they must start with themselves in the matter of helping their homes and their marriages. Everybody wants to point, it's his problem, it's her problem, I don't have a problem. No, you've got to start with self. I pray that you'll start with yourself, that you'll read this book and study this book, become a Christian, establish a Christian home, live as God wants you to live. And I'm going to tell you that you can have a happy home, that you can have a wonderful marriage, that God can bless you abundantly. Let us help you if we possibly can. And we'll see you again next week. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in Him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how He changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do No one ever cared for me like Jesus There's no other friend so kind Thank you, David, for that marvelous lesson on the home. Do you have your paper and pencil ready? Next week, we'll begin a special three-lesson series on the truth about the last days of the planet Earth. So that you can study along with these special lessons, we're offering you this special study booklet at no cost to you. Please send for your free copy as soon as possible. Announcer, we give you our address at the end of the program. So if you don't have a pen ready, get one right now. You might also want to send in for the tape of this lesson. Uh, this tape will, has this week's lesson on one side and last week's lesson on the other side. It's been a joy being with you today, and we'll look forward to being back in your home at the same time next week. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. This has been The Truth in Love, sponsored by the Churches of Christ of the North Texas area. For a copy of today's program, additional information, or Bible correspondence course at no charge to you, please write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Once again, write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. We invite you to attend the Church of Christ in your area. Join us again next Sunday at the same time for The Truth in Love.